ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الله سبحانه وتعالى says in that book there is no doubt it is a guidance to those who are God weary in the past lectures we covered some very important concepts that we said are so important that Imam Ali Salamullahi was martyred for it. And the Imam Al Hassan Salamullahi was martyred for it. And in these days, we com commemorate the martyrdom of Al Imam Al Hussein, who was also martyred for the same reason for information. Why? Because we said information is power. This information that we covered in the last few nights is information that was worth killing for by the Umayyads and Quraysh. They were willing to kill the son, Asipt, the grandson of the Prophet of Allah for what? To prevent people from receiving this information that he was propagating. So today when we gather and we come to the center to learn this information, Al Imam Al Hussein Salamullah Alay is very happy with us. For when we come here, we're truly doing a ziyara to him. We're honoring him by enlightening our intellects. For that is why he was martyred. There are others who wanted man to be in darkness. Not just Muslims, but humanity as a whole. For that serves their purpose. And we said that in an information age such as the one that we are in today, where Facebook reigns, MySpace, Google, Gmail, YouTube, where everything gets out and governments take advantage of such technology so that they can get their voice out and their message out, it has become part of their working strategy. And so... It has become part of the strategy of those who want to distribute information and propagate it. But as we know, such channels of information propagation are not always used positively. Right? We know, for example, that when we're on the computer, very simply, we know ourselves that sometimes when we sit on Facebook, we go on there just to say hi to a couple of our friends. But what ends up happening? We, ends up, we end up staying till 2 a.m. And our parents keep telling us you should go to sleep. Or we're on Facebook and our parents tell us it's time for namaz, for salah. And we say, just a minute, just a minute. I'll be done. I'll almost be done. I'm almost done. Or we're sitting watching TV, which can be a great means of information. But when it's time for namaz, for salah, what happens? All of a sudden... We choose that information and the football game and the basketball game, the playoffs and the baseball game and the MLS, subhanAllah, the entire year. You don't watch MLS, but when it's time for Salah, all of a sudden MLS, Major League Soccer, is interesting to us. Right? This is the power of information. It has the ability to draw us in. The good of it and the bad of it. Sometimes we look at information just to see how bad it is. Am I right? The most famous commercials in the world in the history of marketing and media aren't the best commercials. Usually they're the worst. There are entire shows dedicated on TV, on cable that say the worst and most memorable commercials. To this day, I still remember a commercial for submarines, subs, from 
15 years ago that was so horrendous that there's no way you could forget it. Today, in order for you to be known, what do you do? You do something bad so that people remember. As parents, we have children. And there's always one of our children who we blame for everything. I was one of those kids when I was young. Whenever something would go wrong in the house, they hear a sound, what do they say? House! <laughs> we have a tendency for some reason to connect ourselves with the negative information. But it's not an inclination that is actually natural to us. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Inna nafsa, He says, and the self, Ammar bisu. He says that it tells you to do bad. That means that the whisperer, when he comes and whispers, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you, the Master, the Lord of mankind. From what? From the whisperer, the whispers of the evil whisperer. It whispers to whom? It whispers to the self, Al-Ammara Basu, that commands you or tells you to do bad things. But can it also tell you to do good things? Yes, it can. If I do what? If I control my intellect. A great scholar of ours called Al Mullah Naraqi. He is the author of a book called Jami' Sa'adat. He says in his book that we have four powers. How many powers? Four. We have the power of the intellect. We have the power of desire, the power of imagination, and the power of anger. The power of the intellect, the power of desire, imagination, and anger. If the intellect is not up to par, it won't be able to control the other powers. Its primary role, the role of the intellect, is to do what? To control the reins of desire, of imagination, and anger. That means that these four powers are what cause me to make the right or wrong choices. You see? We've been talking about choices and how they relate to the intellect. And we said that the intellect essentially is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with this intellect so that we can do what? So that we can choose between right and wrong through logical and deductive reasoning, right? And so if we understand how this process happens, then surely we would be more mindful the next time we're faced with a decision to make. So if I know that if my intellect is weak, what's going to happen? I might get angry really fast. Well, we said that the intellect, what's its role? It's connected directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Because Allah says, surely I created, I did not create a creation that is more endeared or beloved to me than you. The first hadith in the book of Kafi, right? Remember that? Mahdi, right? Do you remember that? So then, there's a direct relationship between the intellect and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A direct relationship. And then he says, surely it is you that I command and it is you that I forbid, which means that our decisions are made where? Through the intellect. And then it is you that I punish and you that I reward, which means what? Which means that that's what will be judged on the Day of Judgment, the intellect. Which means that it is essential to the choice-making process. Without it, I cannot make the right choice. So then, if I am faced with a situation that angers me quickly, or a situation that causes me to fall into desire quickly, or a situation that causes me to go wild with my imagination, then what does the intellect do? 
it says, whoa, hold on to those reins tight. Let me pull you in, O oh anger. Let me quieten you down, O oh imagination, O oh desire. Let me put you in control so that you're at what point? So that you're at a point of wasata. So that you are at a point of being moderate. Imam Ali, salamullahi alayhi, Imam Ali Salamullahi Alay says in the short sayings, you'll find the saying in Nahjul Balagha. Make sure you have a copy of Nahjul Balagha, the path of eloquence, or also entitled The Peak of Eloquence. Make sure you have a copy of that book in your library, just like Prolegomena of the Holy Quran that I mentioned to you earlier. If you go to the back of that book, there are short sayings. Very wise sayings. It is said that he who wants to be eloquent in his speech is to read Nahj al And he who wants to be wise should read those short sayings. One of the short sayings, the Imam Salamullah Alayhi says that you find an idiot, you find an idiot. You hear me? He says you find an idiot either in a state of deficiency or in a state of excess. Notice how he defines an idiot. You find an idiot either in a state of deficiency or a state of excess. Which means a person who is not an idiot, a person who is aqil, who is an intellectual, rational, where would he be? In the, in the middle. Also, Imam Ali, salamullahi alayhi, he says, when he speaks about anger, he says, anger that is in excess is tahawur. What's tahawur? Tahawur is when a person acts irrationally. And he says, anger that is in deficiency is cowardice. He says, anger that is in moderation, in the middle, is what? Is courage. Anger in excess is what? Irrationality, tahawur. Anger in deficiency is cowardice. But anger in moderation, where one is in control of one's anger, and is angered only for Allah and for the truth and for protecting the truth, that is anger that is considered what? Say it. Say it. Courage. Courage. So here the Imam gives us very simply a great measuring stick by which we can know whether we are idiots or not and whether we are irrational or not and how to recognize courage sometimes we say this person is courageous and some people look and say I don't know if that was really courageous that might have been really absolutely irrational what he did right how do we know that's the gauge that's the mizan that's the scale by which we can figure out whether an act was courageous or not whether whether an act was an act of idiocy or not that tells us then that this helps us do what? When we make a choice to control our anger, we know now how to control it. Because our intellect is awake. It is aware of how to do that. Yes? Also, when it comes to desire, if my desire is in excess, if I'm eating 20 chocolate bars in one sitting, then that's problematic because that's in excess. If I'm sitting at the PlayStation, or the Wii, of course none of us do that. For, I'm not saying you don't sit and play the video games, but I'm saying for four hours, four hours, I see some people covering their eyes and their faces. 
for four hours, five hours, or watching TV for five hours, or spending time on the internet for eight hours at a time, or a total of eight per day. And I'm not talking writing a paper, right? Between Facebook and YouTube and chatting with my buddies, right? Excess or no? Excessive or no? Excessive or no? You tell me. Too much? Too much. Too much. And what does Imam Ali say? He says it shouldn't be in excess. And not in deficiency, in moderation. Moderation is a good thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran that He made us a middle nation. Why? So that we bear witness unto others. He made us a middle nation. Notice how this reflects the saying of Imam Ali. Salamullah alayhi salawat. So yesterday, we spoke about the legitimacy of the Holy Qur'an. Today, we continue that and we segue into prophethood. One thing that I didn't cover yesterday was the whole issue of the supernatural. Because I covered only the logical proofs, right? And then I moved on to what? Looking into the book and seeing some data that was recorded in the Holy Quran 1400 years ago. And we today, only in the past couple of hundred years, discovered this information. So now, what we look at is we say, well, this supernatural nature of this message. What kind of supernatural does it have to be? It has to be something that is beyond what we can fathom as humans. It is only out of Allah's benevolence, and we mentioned that word before. What's that word? Say it, say it out loud so I know you remember it. Benevolence. Benevolence. That what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send us a message. We all agreed about that, right? We said this is a necessity. Just like I send a text message to tell my friends where to meet up, right? It's a logical necessity for Allah to send me a message. And that message comes to me in the form of a manual. Just like when I go to school, they give me a textbook. So I have a textbook, a manual, right? And this is only out of Allah's what? What's the word? Benevolence. Ahsan. Now the question is, this miracle when it comes, this message, should it not speak to the people of the time? In order for them to recognize that it's a miracle. So we notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He sends the message to the Jews, what does He do? He sends them Prophet Moses with what? What miracle? Magic. He doesn't send a miracle that they can't relate to. He sends a message that they can relate to. Their time was a magical time, full of magic, sir. Their high priests practiced this magic. So when Prophet Moses came along, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a message and a miracle that spoke to the people, and that was magic. So what does he give him? He gives him his staff, right? And in the staff slam, as I like to call it, you get it? Good. In that staff slam, when they got together and they had this challenge to see who was more capable as a magician, the high priests of Pharaoh or Moses, the representative of Allah, what happens? They throw down, he throws down, and who wins the slam? Moses alayhi salam. You see? And who is the first to submit to the God of Moses? 
the high priests themselves, they defy Pharaoh. They defy Pharaoh. The high priests. Move on to the time of Jesus, alayhi salam. The time of Jesus was the time of medicine. It was the time of medicine. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Jesus the ability, by Allah's permission, to heal the sick, to cure the blind of their blindness, to cure the lepers, to bring the dead back to life by His permission. You see? He speaks to the people in accordance to their intellects. Didn't we mention this before? Speaking to people in accordance with their intellects? Now when the Holy Quran came, it came during the time, this manual, that we've proven, right? We proved its legitimacy already. This manual, when it came, it came to a people during the time of eloquence in, in speech. Poetry reigned during that time. Poetry was the science of the time. Eloquence in speech was the science of the time. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He do? He sends a message that has to be more eloquent in, in the words that are used and the phrases that are used and the sentences that are coined and the paragraphs that are made and that as a collective of verses that no one would be able to come up with this and by reading it and thinking about it, they would realize that no man could have come up with anything close to this. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira was known as the highest poet, just like those high priests. He was known as the most well-renowned poet of the time, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Abu Jahl, he brings him to this court, to his court, and he says to him, go and listen to this man who's reciting these verses, Muhammad. And what I want you to do is come back and give me the 411. Give me the information, because information is power. Let me know who is this guy, right? Who's challenging my position and my power. Get me the lowdown on him. Let me know who he is. What he brings, what is this information? So what does he do? He goes. He goes and he listens to this man named Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. And what does he hear? He hears the words of Allah. He comes back to Abu Jahl and his companion and what does he say to them? He says, surely... Surely, I heard words that are higher than the skies. I heard words that are deeper than the deepest oceans. I heard words that are more colorful than the rainbows in the sky and the flowers that you see. I heard words that are supernatural, that can come from no man. Salawat. Salawat. They said to him, we sent you there as our ally. Now you come back to us as Muhammad's ally. We sent you so that you come back and tell us some bad things about what you heard. And you return to us and you say these beautiful words. They said to him, come up with something negative. He said, it might be magic. So a verse was reve revealed. What he said, إِنَّهُ لَسِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرٌ To mark this event. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He sent a message, He sent a message that was supernatural. How? Through the simple letters that they use, them Arabs, those Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula, those who coined the Arabic language, Alif, Lam, Mim, Ya, Seen, Alif, Lam, Ra, Noon, Wal Qalam, Wa Ma Yasturoon. 
Allah is challenging them. He's saying, look at these letters that you use that make up your own language. These letters, Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Ra, Ka Ha, Ya Ain Sad, these letters, read on. See what I made with these letters. And in that time, people were so eloquent in their speech that they knew what was written by a man, what was written by a high scholar in Arabic, and what could never be written by a simple man who is a high scholar. To this day, no one has been able to come up with words such as this. So what does Allah do? You know how we said Allah made sure that Moses السلام, attended the staff slam? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not go without challenging these men. So what does he say to him, to these men? He says in Surah Al-Isra, verse 88, that's chapter 17, verse 88. He says, قُلْ لَإِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ What? He says, say that if they congregate and work together, say to the jinn, to, the, to man and to the jinn, that if they get together to make a book such as this Qur'an, they won't be able to come up with a book such as this book. Even if they were to support each other. Then Allah, you know, it's almost like when you say, well, you'll never be able to do this. And what are you going to say? You'll say, you'll say oh yeah? Really? Oh yeah? We'll see about that. So what does Allah say? He says, okay, okay. He says, fine. He says in Surah Hud, he says in Surah Hud, first he says the Quran, right? He says, if you all get together, O jinn and men, you won't be able to come up with this book. That's a challenge. So what does he do? He tells them, rise to this challenge. Do they rise to it? Can they come up with a book like it? No. He says, okay, don't feel bad. You didn't come up with a book like it? That's fine. Can you come up with 10 chapters like it from that book? So what does he say in Surah Hud? Surah Hud, chapter 11, verse 13. He says, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ or do, or do they say that he came up with these words himself? أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ Then he says, قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ He says, then come with Ten chapters like it. So he gives them a second chance. First he says, come up with a book. They're unable. Then he says, come up with ten chapters. They're unable. Then in Surah Yunus, which is chapter 10, verse 38, what does Allah say? He repeats the same verse almost. He says, He says, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ Again, he says, or do they say, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ Or do they say that he made it up? What does he say to them? He says, قُلْ Say to them, to the Prophet Muhammad, he says, قُلْ Say to them, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ Come up with one chapter. One, one. One chapter. Were they able to? No. To this day, were they able to? No. You see the miracle? You see the miracle? You see how many miracles? Intellectual miracles, informational miracles within the book, and a challenge to come up with the entire book. Ten chapters or even one, and still unable to. What does then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Al-Baqarah? Verse 23, chapter 2, verse 23. He says, 
بسورة من مثله. What does he say? He says, and if you were in doubt, وإن كنتم في ريب, if you were in doubt, مما نزلنا على عبدنا of that which we have revealed upon our servant, our worshiper, Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم صلوات. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ Now, he says, okay, you weren't able to come up with one chapter? Now come up with one chapter from someone like him. Someone like him. Can you come up with a chapter from someone like him? What did Allah mean by this? What is this fourth challenge? Book. Ten chapters, one chapter, one chapter from someone like him. Insha'Allah, tomorrow we'll cover this topic of what is meant by someone like him. In this night, I'd like to speak a little about the story of Ashura. And what I'd like to speak about specifically, since we said information is power, is I want to speak a little about the history. You know, during the time of Muawiyah, Muawiyah, when he knew that he was about to die, what, he, what did he decide to do? He decided to ensure that Yazid would take power after him. We say, what happened to Shura? <laughs> what happened to, there has to be a consensus and people have to get together and decide amongst themselves. You see, Muawiyah himself, he took power, he usurped the Khilafah from Al-Hasan alayhi salam. Al-Imam Al-Hasan alayhi only had the Khilafah for how long? For six months, Muawiyah was telling people and commanding them to, to curse Imam Ali salamullahi alayhi on the pulpits, on the pulpits, on the pulpits. There was a lot of bloodshed. And Imam al-Hasan salamullahi alayhi, he said, listen, so that we can prevent the bloodshed, this is what we'll do. Let's organize a treaty. Just like the Prophet of Allah organized the treaty with the Kuffar. At least Muawiyah was by label a Muslim. Right? By label. Right? By label. So let's sit together and come up with a treaty, some agreement. So he sits with him. He says to him, look, I don't want any more bloodshed. I want to make sure that the Muslims live in peace. So here are my conditions. If you take the rule from me, you take it for a certain amount of time. Then it returns to me. Then after me, it must go to my brother Hussein. Salamullahi alayhi. So what does he do then? Muawiyah says, okay, that's fine. He says to him, and there are more conditions. And I'll only mention a few. He says to him, you have to lead the Muslims in accordance with the book of Allah and his prophet. Okay? Simple request. Not a hard one. He said, okay, fine. He said, and you have to make sure that those that you imprisoned from my followers, from the companions, you have to release them. He said, fine. He said, you have to make sure that you give safe passage to the Shia of Ahlul Bayt. He said, fine. On the day that they were supposed to be signing this treaty, this agreement, what does Muawiyah do? He says, he lifts up this contract and he says, surely this agreement I spit on and I place under my feet. Now, do we think that the Imam al-Hasan didn't know that Muawiyah was going to do this? What was the Imam al-Hasan doing here? 
What was he directing us to? Before the issue of Karbala, information is what? Power. Information is power. So if I understand the reasoning behind why Imam al-Hasan did this, then perhaps I would answer quite a few questions of those who say, well, ayadu billah, that Imam al-Hasan didn't conduct his role as Imam because he should have protected people just as Hussein did by martyring himself or by being martyred, right? Instead, Imam al-Hasan, salamullah alayhi, he said, I want you to pay attention to the fact that this man, though he says he is Muslim, he does not follow the book of Allah or the messenger of Allah. One. Two, this man does not even know the Holy Quran. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Awfu bil He says, He says, uphold the contracts and the promises. He also says, kana mas'ula. He says, and the covenant or the contract or the promise you will be held responsible for. What does he do? He breaks his promise. What does he do? He breaks his covenant. What does he do? He breaks the contract. What does he do? He says basically, I will not listen to you or lead in accordance with the book of Allah and his messenger. This contract and everything in it, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, and everything in it is beneath my foot. The contract said the book of Allah and his messenger, and he puts it beneath his foot. Any Muslim who has read Islamic laws knows the fact that contracts are binding in accordance with the Holy Quran. It's a very clear verse, very clear verses, I should say. So Imam Hassan, what is he doing? He's telling us information is power. Pay attention to what I'm doing here. The first thing you do when you deal with an oppressor, even if he's a Muslim, is not to concede to him, no. It's to talk to him, try to bring rational sense to him, be a moderator, someone who is moderate, not someone who is an excess or deficiency. Be courageous in that way, you see? And then, if the person decides to act like a complete bumbling idiot, then know that he has acted in excess or in deficiency and we have not. And that the sign of a mu'min is what? Moderation. You see? And this was what an Imam al-Hasan was doing. He was setting the tracks, the path for Karbala by doing this. Because if people said, well, why didn't Hussein alayhi salam go up to Muawiyah and try to reason with him? Why didn't he try to establish a treaty? We established a treaty with the kuffar before, during the time of Prophet Muhammad. Why wouldn't we do this with the Muslims? So what does Imam Hassan do? He answers that question. He says, we did. We did do that. And not only that, this man exercised something known as khayarul majlis. In the book of trade, khayarul majlis is basically the right, it's an escape clause saying that I have the right to what? To retract this agreement. I have the right to break the agreement. Khayar al-Majlis happens in the same sitting. It has to happen. Does he do that in the same sitting? No. He doesn't even do that. He doesn't even nullify the contract in the same sitting. It's when they later on come to sign it, that he says this contract is under my feet. So verbally he agreed to everything and a verbal contract in Islam is binding. It's a promise and a covenant. And so what does Muawiyah do? He poisons the Imam al-Hasan salamullahi alayhi and he takes control of the Khilafah. Now the time comes when Muawiyah is ill and realizes he will die. So what does he do? He goes up to Yazid and he says to him, you have to be Khalifa after me. Yazid wasn't near the Khilafah. Yazid was too busy playing with his little monkey and his little 
servants, you know. It was known that he also had homosexual tendencies, okay. It was known that he was a drunkard. He was a boozer. He would drink every night. It was known during the whole day, people would come to him, to his court, and he would be drunk. He wasn't anywhere near the Khilaf in his mind. But when offered to him, he's not going to say, I don't want it. So what happens then? A message is sent to Al-Walid ibn Utbah, who is the wali of Medina, the governor of Medina, commanding him to get the agreement of Al Imam Al Hussein and his companions that they will pay allegiance to Yazid so that he would be their caliph. This is where Marwan ibn al Hakam is brought into the picture to make sure that Al Walid does what he was commanded by Yazid. So, what do they do? They call on the companions of Al Imam Al Hussein and Al Imam Al Hussein to bear allegiance to Yazid. What ends up happening is obviously Imam Hussein and his companions don't want to do this. So they come to him. Imam Hussein says, let's go to him. I will go. You wait for me outside. Gather 30 of my men. He goes to the court of Walid ibn Atba. He goes in. Marwan ibn al-Hakam is there. They say to him, we are here to tell you to do the best thing for your deen and your dunya. <laughs> For your religion and your and this world. What is that, pray tell? That is to bear allegiance to Yazid. He said, Well, I don't think this is something that we should discuss here. We should do this in front of the public. Marwan ibn al Hakam tells Al Walid, who said to him, Okay, that's fine. He says to him, No. If he leaves now, you will not get his allegiance. If I were you, I, was, I would lop his head off right now. Sever it right now. Right in front of Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi. Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi says to him, You? You lop my head off? Do you know who I am? I am the grandson of the Prophet of Allah. I am the son of Ali Amir al Mu'mineen. I am the son of Fatima. Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen. I am the brother of Al Hassan. Who are you? Who are you to speak to me in such a way? Do you know with whom you are speaking? Al Walid ibn Atba, what does he say then? He says to Marwan, he says, Surely, surely he who does something like this to the son of the Prophet of Allah, surely he will not be in heaven. So Al Walid was kind of shaking. He didn't know what to do. Imam Al Hussein leaves the court. The next day, he sees Marwan ibn Al Hassan. During the day, Marwan says, You should do this. I command you to do this. He tells him, Who are you to command me? That night, the Prophet of Allah is visited by Imam Al Hussein. Prophet of Allah was in his grave. Imam Hussein goes and visits him, prays a couple of rak'ahs for him makes a dua and at that time he sees a vision of prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam what does prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam tell him he tells him he tells him hussein hussein you are allah wants for you to be martyred in the land of karbala you are to go to karbala he says to him this is not something new to Imam Hussein Salamullah Alayhi. He grew up hearing this. He grew up hearing this. He knew he was going to be martyred on the land of Karbala. Remember, we mentioned yesterday, Imam Al Hassan told him that he would be. He heard this as a child growing up. This is not new to Imam Al Hussein, but this was a confirmation for him. So, what does he do? He goes then to the grave of his mother Fatima Alayhi Salam. He prays again and he makes dua, bidding her farewell because he's leaving to Karbala. He then goes to Imam Al Hassan's grave and he makes dua and he prays and he bids him farewell. He then goes to his companions and he says to them, 
Get ready for we are going to leave to Karbala. He then goes to the women of Ahlul Bayt and he says to them, prepare yourselves for we are leaving to Karbala. He then prepares himself with his companions and they get on their horses and they head out. And when they head out, brothers and sisters, when they head out to Karbala, they reach a land at which Imam Hussein Salamullah stops his horse. It is there that Al Imam Al Hussein Salamullah would look at his companions and ask them, O oh, companions, what is the name of this land? They said to him, This land is called Al Ghadriya. He said to them, is there another name for this land? They said to him, yes, it's called Nainawa. He asked them, is there another name for this land? They said to him, yes, it is Karbala. He took a deep breath and a sigh and he said, yes, yes. He said, I seek refuge from every from every kerb and bala, I seek refuge in Allah, from every calamity and trial. Surely this is the place where we will set our camp. Surely this is the place where our blood will be shed. Surely this is the place where our tents will be burned. Surely this is the place where our women will be imprisoned. Surely this is the place. Surely this is the place where we will meet our end. Surely this is the place where our clothes will be stolen from our dead bodies on the land of Karbala. If we move on and we look back, to what will happen inshallah tomorrow in the majlis Muslim ibn Aqil's daughter Hamida Hamida and Imam al Hussein took her with him to the land of Karbala so that maybe she can see her father Muslim news of Muslims death did not come until later they were already on the way when they were on the way to Karbala a couple of messengers had come on the way and the Imam al Hussein asked them what happened to Muslim, and they told him. At that point, he didn't know what to do. The Imam al Hussein went up to Hamida. He went to one girl after the other until he got to Hamida. He said, Where is Hamida? He moved from girl, little girl to little girl. Through the children, he made his way. He found Hamida. He looked at Hamida. He put his hand on the forehead of Hamida. He looked at Hamida. She looked up at him with those small glimmer, glimmering eyes. She said to him, O oh son of Allah, you put your hand on me as though I'm an orphan. <laughs> Was she an orphan now? <laughs> Imam Hussein, he said to her, My dear, today I am your father. Today, Zainab is your mother. Today, my daughters are your sisters. <laughs> but who would be there to say that to Sukaida and Ruqayya? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Madloom Karbala. Say it with me. Madloom Karbala. Madloom Karbala. Shaheed Karbala. Shaheed.
Karbala. Let's raise our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him, Amman yujibu al-muttarra idha wa yakshifu su. Oh, he who answers the call of he who is in hardship and removes all hardship. Amman yujibu al-muttarra idha da'a wa yakshifu su. 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 Oh Allah. We ask you that you brighten our paths with the light of the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we ask you that you remove all sickness and sin from our hearts, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, make our actions, make our actions a manifestation of our belief, Ya Allah. Oh Allah. Give health to our sick, Ya Allah. So many people who are sick who have asked for our dua. Ya Allah, we pray for them. We pray for all those who are sick. We have a brother in, the, in our congregation who has a problem with his vision and his eye. Ya Allah, bihaqqi alili karbala, bihaqqi zayn al abideen. Ya arham al rahimeen. Fix his vision, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you that you fix the vision of. Zahra al Musawi in Najaf, Ya Allah, the four year old who's losing her eyesight, Ya Allah. We ask you that you remove the cancer from the body of all of our cancer patients, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, bihaqqi alili karbala, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you that you remove all sickness other than cancer from all of the mu'mineen, Ya Allah, in our congregation and in other congregations, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, give health to Manal in Baghdad and Sayyid Ahmed in Colorado and Zahra Ishnawa in Najaf. Ya Arham al rahmin and all those who are sick in this community. And the last that we ask is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen that we recite a Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, Ya Allah. We recite a Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha on the souls of our dearly departed, those who were the founders of the center and were no longer with us now, Ya Allah. Those who have lost a dear one and a loved one, Ya Allah, from the center. And the souls of all of the mu'mineen wal mu'minat, ba'd as salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar Alhamdulillah. Dua al-Hujjah.